got a man now I've got Porgy I understand now I've got Porgy I'm through with my ways And his way is my way stroke of fate or good luck or what have you my managers booked me because I'd done the Riviera but now what, what was I going to do and so what they did they booked me up in the Borscht circuit or the Jewish school the Catskills and I went up there and came down after three months time of working all the various resorts the Concord the um gross singers um uh, places called Browns, Raleigh's, I mean, just many, 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 many clubs. I came down from the mountains with over 100,000, 150,000 Jewish fans. A following that came right down from wherever and helped. I mean, that just made my career, made me absolutely. So it did. It started here and it moved right to the east and and that was that. So I had I always had a huge Jewish following. And therefore, when I went to Miami to work there, this would have been the first black performer in a hotel on Miami Beach, which was totally unheard of. Absolutely. And it did, it brought about a lot of stuff. It brought about burning crosses and um, threats. And, um, but Dave Levinson was his name. He said to me that, it, when, that when he was building this club that he would like to open it up. You need to get there because we're going to be digging into the living legend herself, Joyce Bryant, in today's Hollywood Black History episode. Y'all know I love me some Joyce Bryant. She was just a trailblazer, an icon in so many ways, and it just it sucks that her story has been hidden for so long. So we're going to just uncover um as much as we can about Joyce's life and career in today's episode. This is going to be a Hollywood Black History deep dive special. So strap in, grab some snacks. I think you guys are going to really enjoy this one. And with that being said, let's get to the video. Joyce Bryant was 14 when she started her singing career in 1942. Within 10 years, she was a real star, a major star. And she was known then as the black Marilyn Monroe. Joyce was born Ione Emily Bryant on October 14, 1927 in Oakland, California. Her father, Whitfield W. Bryant, worked as a chef for the Southern Pacific Railroad and wasn't home often, while her mother, Dorothy Constance Withers, was a homemaker. 
Joyce grew up in a strict Seventh-day Adventist home and was the third of eight children. Musical talent ran in her family with her maternal grandfather being Frank Douglas Withers, a jazz trombonist, and her cousin Clara Bryant being a famed jazz trumpeter around the same time as Joyce's career. While Bryant's image is that of a bold and glamorous diva, her early years were actually anything but. Joyce actually grew up as a very quiet child in a strict household with dreams about as far from the stage as one could humanly get. She actually wanted to be a sociology teacher as a child. No simple pleasures like a movie or a dance or, or, or listening to records. Or... Without much for her at home in terms of fun or excitement and affection, Joyce ran away from home to elope with the boy that she had a crush on at 14. However, the marriage was never consummated, and she ended up ditching her new husband just as quickly as she found him in Reno. It was ridiculous, too. It was a ridiculous age at 14. 14 years old. At 14. Well, let me tell you, I don't know. It was so silly, but I think I wanted to leave home. I wanted to get away from the diapers and all of that. I have a huge family. And I had this terrific crush on this guy. And How old was he? He was much older than I. I shouldn't say much older. 16. But no, 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 he wasn't. He was about 20 years old. Right. But uh, I was a pretty well-developed 14-year-old. And, um... This is so, a well-developed evening, isn't it? <laughs> I'm you afraid were so. 13, you were 14. All right, go ahead. And, um... And stayed developed. And st yes, yes. But what happened... So we went to Reno to get married and left San Francisco and ran to Reno to get married. Now, I got married to leave home. I don't know what he got married for. but And we were walking uh, down a street, and I saw in the window, there was a woman standing with this beautiful negligee on with a little dog, a little... Um, a little play dog, right? Not a real animal. He wanted me to have the negligee, and I wanted the dog. And this is what oh. happened. This is silly. This is what well, can I tell you? And so, because he wouldn't get the dog for me, I went to the bus station and came home. And that was that. That was my <laughs> that was Not end. long after, Joyce would get her start on stage in Los Angeles when she would go down to meet her cousins. The girl stumbled across an amateur singing contest at a local club, and her cousins dared her to enter. And so Joyce did. She went up on stage and sang a rendition of On Top of Old Smokey. And in a 1955 Jet Magazine interview, Joyce recalled, After a while, I found that I was the only one singing. A few minutes later, the club owner offered me $25 to go up on stage, and I took it because I needed the money to get back home. However, that one gig led to Joyce signing a two-week contract with the club for $125 a week, or about $1,900 in today's money. And from there, her immense talent took her across the country, where she landed a $400 weekly gig at La Martinique Nightclub in New York and a 118-show tour with the Catskill Mountains Hotel. Yeah. Hollywood would come knocking by the mid-40s, and Joyce would make her first appearance as a nightclub singer in the political drama Mr. Ace. saw the young songstress quickly rising through the ranks to superstardom. However, the status always remained at least slightly out of reach. For one thing, Joyce was a talent, but she lacked an identity. The little black girl with a big voice was still just an ingenue, and her commitment to singing pop songs rather than blues or jazz like other black singers of her time confused audience members. Once, Joyce recalled being told that millions of white girls were doing what she was doing, and why not sing something she knew, like the blues? For another thing, Joyce's sweet, innocent little girl image set her apart from more sophisticated and mature singers of her era, such as Lena Horne. This would change by the 1950s. During this time, Bryant found herself billed after Josephine Baker, the Josephine Baker, which just speaks to the girl's skill and talent as a singer, but also... Who the hell wants to go up on stage after Josephine Baker? <laughs> Understandably afraid of being upstaged by the iconic superstar, she quickly struck the idea to create a new image for herself on the fly. I remember that I was going to be a performance with this woman in California. And uh, I heard so much about her voice. And it's true, she just ripped the audience inside out without having opened her mouth. 
see if she's going to do she the ground and what was I going to do? We were on stage with her. So I came up with the idea to paint my hair. And I coated my hair with lime and I used radiator paint and painted my hair on silver. And the, uh, there was an extraordinary impact. Drunk with love, my body. Here I was, and the audience was learning the nursery. And, um, uh, and Josephine said to me, she dyed her hair with silver radiator paint and found a slinky silver gown and matching silver fox fur. And from that night on, the innocent ingenue was transformed into a sensuous sex symbol. This moment would mark Joyce's ascent into superstardom. And not only did she become a sensation overnight, according to Bryant, she said, When I stepped out on stage, I stopped everything. Josephine herself, impressed by Bryant's power play, even remarked to Joyce after her stunt, Touché, darling. That wouldn't be the only change in Bryant's career after her power move. First of all, wait a minute, though. Can you imagine getting props from Josephine Baker? <laughs> like, you like you guys, I would die, <laughs> okay? I would, I would have simply just passed away. <laughs> anyway, that wouldn't be the only change in Bryant's career after her iconic power move. In 1952, Bryant became the first black entertainer to perform at the Hotel Algiers Aladdin Room in Miami Beach, Florida. This was a very racist and segregated place, and segregation actually kept her from being able to even enjoy the luxuries of the hotel. She wasn't allowed to spend the night at the hotel or be photographed outside of the Aladdin room. Before she was set to perform in Miami, the KKK actually burned a cross in the yard of the hotel owners, and Joyce's management, fearful for her safety, suggested that she change the sexy ending of her provocative show, wherein she was supposed to sit on the lap of an audience member and give them a kiss on the cheek or a bite on the ear. Joyce refused. In a now-deleted interview, Joyce explains exactly what happened when she did perform her sexy act as written. According to Joyce, and this is what she said because I remember seeing the interview, I hate to God that it was deleted off of the internet, but this is what she said, y'all. Trust me, I remember. I got you. This is what she said. So, I did this for the first show. When I went out for the second show, I couldn't see any women. And I was thinking, where in the world are all the women? And when I stepped out on stage, there were all the rednecks and the aisles and the front row, hoping to be the next one to get bitten or kissed. The papers the next day picture Joyce Bryant being gifted a diamond bracelet by a white male dancer with the caption, Are whites becoming more accepting of brown beauties? That same spread also features Eartha Kitt and another white man. And speaking of Eartha Kitt, okay, so let me tell you guys about how I'm so... F I'm trying not to cuss. I'm so freaking mad <laughs> that so many things got deleted off like there were so many great pictures and there were interviews that I had that I just did not say because I just assumed they would always be there. I don't know why. But there's this really good picture of Eartha Kitt, Joyce, uh, Harry Belafonte, and there's one more woman with them. I want to say she'll, I don't know who it is, honestly. I'm not even going to guess. But I know she's famous. Um, and they're all like, it looks like they're in a club. Maybe they were like before performance or something because they're all, you know, dressed up. I don't know if maybe they were like partying or what. But they're like all like arm in arm, arms wrapped over each other. And it looks like they're kicking their legs up together and they're laughing. It is the cutest thing y'all and then in the picture Eartha is like hugged up under Harry Belafonte and you can see her like looking up at him with these love struck puppy dog eyes and I'm like she is so look at her with her little crush she is so love struck over this man it is the cutest freaking thing bruh and I so hate that I can't find that picture anymore but y'all just gotta trust me that it's out there if I ever find it I'll try to put it up somewhere maybe on the community page but it is so cute anywho anywho Joyce stayed booked and busy from this point on, appearing in the most upscale venues across the country, including the Copacabana in Manhattan, Coconut Grove in Hollywood, the Apollo Theater in Harlem, and the Chicago Theater in Illinois. 
Her image was plastered on every prominent black magazine of the day with cover stories and spreads being done on her. And she was one of the few black entertainers to receive a full spread in Life magazine who profiled her in 1953. During this time, Joyce became regarded as the first nationally recognized dark-skinned female sex symbol and was voted top five most beautiful black women in Ebony Magazine, right along with Dorothy Dandridge, Lena Horne, and Eartha Kitt, garnering the nicknames the Black Marilyn Monroe, the Bronze Blonde Bombshell, and the Black Venus. Her image was so sexy that many of her songs were banned from radio play. And I'm gonna be honest with y'all, like... Matter of fact, y'all can hear it for yourselves. These songs are quite sexy for the time. I'm like, okay, sis is... Sis is giving us, you know, she giving us sex. She giving us sensuality. At around $200,000 a gig, Joyce was also one of the highest paid entertainers of the era. So much so that Dorothy Dandridge actually pulled her aside once before a curtain and asked her how she managed to talk her management into paying her so much. She wanted advice on how to get so much money. She also asked Joyce for advice on her performance anxiety. She said, how do you go up there and make it look so easy? It seems so easy for you. Joyce also reportedly said about Dorothy, she used to just throw up sometimes before performances. She was just so scared. But what Dorothy didn't know was that it actually wasn't easy at all. In fact, Bryant's stage persona was a constant point of contention for her. Her parents were strongly against her singing career with her mother likening it to prostitution and Joyce herself also had reservations about her sexy image. She felt that what she was doing was sinful with her provocative gowns and teasing persona. But the act kept bringing opportunities to her door in the form of movie deals. Joyce was reportedly one of the desired stars up for the role of Carmen Jones, which would later go to Dorothy Dandridge. And just a little side note, you guys, I was thinking about it um, recently. Personally, and no shade to Dorothy, like, she's great, that's my girl, birthday buddy, because, you know, we both weren't born on the same day and everything. But I really think that Eartha Kitt would have killed that role she would have bodied you cannot tell me eartha would not have bodied the role of carmen okay eartha just like and, and dorothy gave it to us too like dorothy gave us bad girl she gave us sexy she gave us these she gave it to us now i'm not taking away from her but eartha like eartha literally the role of carmen was literally built for for like eartha like it really was um and then also, uh, you know, Dorothy's voice was dubbed by an opera singer because, I mean, even though Dorothy had pipes, she didn't have, like, opera singer pipes. And if it had went to Joyce, even though Joyce wasn't trained for opera or anything, Joyce had a very, like, operatic voice sometimes. And I feel like, Do like, Joyce would have, like, killed the singing parts. I don't know how she would have played the role but she would have bodied the singing parts. And do y'all remember reading, I don't know if anybody ever read this, but James Baldwin actually did a write-up back in the day, back in the 50s when this movie came out, where he was saying, like, you know, Pearl Bailey should have had played the part of Carmen because Pearl Bailey is a better actress. And, you know, no shade, no tea, but I agree with him. Like, Pearl Bailey is a better actress. But he was talking about how because of colorism and, you know, Pearl is not like the slender, you know, because Pearl is not, she's not, a, she was not fat or anything, but she was definitely not like that slender, shapely type of slinky idea and because she was more of a darker skinned girl they would have never given that part to her i don't know dorothy bodied the role but honey i can't help but think that eartha of everybody eartha would have killed it and then i would have been very curious to see what joyce did with it but that's a little side note sorry i had to go on a little tangent let me uh let me let me move forward <laughs> Joyce's profile was getting so high that Hollywood directors were actually talking of making a film built around the songstress's singing abilities. And even her booking agent urged her to take a lead role in a film that was being produced in this time period. Bryant was also featured in the film Porgy and Bess. Her schedule was hectic and demanding, and to keep up with it, Brian began abusing pills like many of her peers of the day to make it through the never-ending work weeks, developing a dangerous addiction. She also had drug problems. 
it's true, during those days, you have to take sleeping pills. I had no need to take sleeping pills to go to sleep, and I guess um, up and down is to go to bed, and up is to wake up or what have you. Not only that, but the singer's signature locks were starting to become damaged from the dye. After a particularly bad dye job, she ended up having to resort to wearing wigs. Since she no longer needed the gimmick of the silver hair anyway, she quickly dropped the platinum tresses. But that was just one of many problems that would face the Chanteuse. Joyce was constantly weary of the company around her. The club owners, often gangsters and other shady characters, were always lusting after her body, hitting on her, and making her uncomfortable. She also feared for her safety, thinking that the men were trying to drug her. In fact, there's a story by Bryant herself where she says that when she was sitting at at a dinner table i think she was like either at some kind of party or something or it was like after one of her performances one of these men actually tried to stick a needle of something into her arm and she had to get away from them just as quick as she could like it was crazy stuff going on around her Often these men couldn't separate Bryant's sultry stage persona from her actual personality, which was considerably more conservative. In fact, she frequently turned down dates, she didn't drink, she didn't smoke, she didn't do drugs, and she constantly faced sexual harassment and abuse. They didn't think about the person inside. I was a sex Never. symbol, and as far as they were concerned, I was sleeping every trip, my every little, every ladder, every rung of the ladder. I slept my way up. This is as far as they're concerned. They had no idea what kind of person I was. And didn't want to know. No. But you see, whatever sex I exuded, and I think, uh, I used to have men come and beat the door, the dressing doors down. I mean, and, and look at me thinking I was ready to just <laughs> right then and there. And I'm wondering, what's going on with you? What's happening? I didn't know that I exuded that kind of thing or that kind of sensuality. I didn't realize you what didn't it was try. then. You didn't try. It was and there. And I didn't try. You didn't try. It was so just there. there. Whatever happened in their mind. And then also that thing, living up to that image. I mean, seriously. I hate to say in bed, living up to that image. People have this, oh, sexy, this whatever it is. Oh, that's I mean, a pressure. This fantasy that they oh. have. Seriously. Right. And That's so they want you to move that right in to bed. Well, I always said or that everybody happened. everybody always adored me, but nobody loved me. There. When they True. found yeah. out, you know, say, that I was just a basic human being yeah. and that I brushed my teeth and did other ne uh, necessary nobody things. Nobody wants to know so, that. All of this came to a head when one night after refusing a man's advances, she was physically assaulted in her dressing room. Of course, being a black woman... I was going to say in those times, but really in any time, people place the blame in the wrong place. And some of her fans soured against her sexy image because of this incident. And as if that wasn't bad enough, Joyce's most prized possession, her voice, was also beginning to suffer. The constant strain on her vocal cords left her with an injury that left her unable to perform. One night, Joyce overheard her management discussing a treatment with the doctors for how to treat her voice fast enough for her to be able to perform that night. The doctors suggested that they lace her throat with cocaine. They said that she would be able to perform as the cocaine would numb the pain, but it was likely that she would develop a addiction, to which her manager literally said, I don't care what you do, just make her sing. Disgusted, Joyce had had enough. She marched in and immediately told her management, I quit. Show business at Lena Horn in 1973. I suppose she'd say it today. Mm -hmm. Show business is a rotten profession for a black woman. It's filled with spoilers and takers. You have to hold on by your fingernails. Someone really has to be in your corner to survive. Someone solely for you. Yes, it's true. I believe that. I, I really believe that. Joyce Bryant walked away from the height of her career in 1955 at 28 years old. Wounded from her time in mainstream entertainment, Joyce jumped headfirst into her religion by enrolling in a seven-day Adventist college and becoming a missionary. And even though she was sometimes unwelcome or judged by certain members of her church for her former career as a singer, Bryant claimed that God saved her life. Joyce was finally at peace with her life and her decision to leave show business. Over the course of the 60s, the singer would find herself in financial woes thanks to unscrupulous management stealing her money, and she would also have trouble with her taxes. But Joyce never lost her fight, her spirit, her faith, or her love for music. She obtained vocal lessons to become classically trained and returned to music by singing opera. 
Even in a completely different genre, Bryant still dominated, performing with the Watergate Symphony in Washington, D.C., the New York City Center Opera Company, and various European opera companies. Once the 80s rolled around, Bryant reprised her old act of singing her classic pop tunes on stages, but this time it was on her own terms. No sexy image, no slinky gowns, no silver hair, no pomp and circumstance. Just a lady and her talent. Joyce herself also became a vocal coach in the 80s, training some of the most talented voices in music, such as Phyllis Hyman and Jennifer Holliday. If you're wondering why a documentary or movie hasn't been made on this absolute icon yet, get in line. Because honestly, attempts have been made. However, according to Joyce and her family, they're seemingly blocked at every turn, with videos, interviews, and performances being taken down. Both Bryant and her niece strongly believe that the Illuminati does not want Joyce's story to be told. And despite how I might feel about that personally, I will say that it's very odd. Even though, like I said, I have my own beliefs about the Illuminati and I don't think they line up with Joyce and her, her and her families. But look, I'm telling y'all, there were interviews, there were pictures that I have found back in the day. I always knew I wanted to do a video on Joyce Bryant. And I have known about these videos and these pictures and all this good stuff for at least a couple of years now. And it's just weird to me that they keep disappearing off the internet. Like, I can't find some of these things anywhere. It's really crazy how hard they are to find and how they've literally been scrubbed from the web despite the fact that they were available, like, just a year ago. Anyway, that's a part of the reason why I decided to include so many clips of Joyce speaking and singing in this video so that, you know... One, we kind of have a place for the bit of existing content of Joyce um, to sort of reside. And also because I want people to hear this still living legend tell her story in part in her own words. After all, hearing anything straight from the source will always be better than any retelling or recount could ever be. And who knows, like, maybe this will inspire the next generation of filmmakers, hint, hint, to jump on this and tell this story. I mean, Coco Jones is sitting over here with nothing better to do than the damn Bel Air reboot. So let's give Coco Jones um, something. Let's give Normani something. To, what is Normani doing? Let's give Normani something to do in between the five years it takes to, to make her next album. Anywho, but that that being said the lovely miss bryant is still alive and well with us today at 95 years old and is currently being cared for by her niece she's even on instagram under joyce bryant official a page that is ran by her niece and um it seems like they really love to respond to fans and questions and yeah they really appreciate stuff like that so while this woman is still living to smell them let's go ahead and give her her flowers for stopping by looking back at the way we were today i wanted to take a look at the life of joyce bryant the bronze blonde bombshell joyce was born in 1927 to a large christian family in california and at the age of 14 joyce participated in a nightclub audience performance and sang on top of old smoky where at the end she was offered a two-week contract at $125 a week. Her mother initially was against her daughter being in show business, but Joyce eventually went on for the next three years to perform with the Flannoy Trio, along with an older female chaperone. Her moniker, The Belter, came from her boisterous performances, and she began her solo career when Pearl Bailey got laryngitis and suggested Joyce go on in her place, which she sure did. Her silver hair came out of competition with being on the same bill as Josephine Baker and not wanting to be outdone by Baker. She painted her hair with radiator paint and donned a silver low cut gown and a silver full length mink. And when she stepped onto the stage, Joyce said, I stopped everything. Even Josephine was impressed. For after the performance, she sort of smiled and tilted her head as to say, touche to Joyce. The moment was a significant one in Joyce's career. 
It solidified her trademark look that catapulted her into stardom and marked her as a show-stopping singer, often compared to other entertainers. Bryant was referred to as the Black Marilyn Monroe, but many would beg to differ since Joyce had natural talent and her career was well underway when Marilyn was just learning to become an entertainer at Fox Studios in 1946. So it would thus be more fitting to say that Monroe was the white Joyce Bryant. <laughs> Walter Winchell, the famous columnist who could make or break one's career with the stroke of his pen, was quoted as saying that Joyce was the voice you'll always remember. She was internationally acclaimed for her four and a half octave vocal range. Joyce was well respected amongst her peers in the entertainment community. She was well loved and not a bad word can be found about Joyce. She was the Black Venus. Mr. Johnson's publications was very, very on top of having Joyce on all of their covers. Jet, Hugh, Our World Magazine, Ebony, and she was even featured in Life Magazine. Zelda Wynn Valdez was the designer who created all of Joyce's beautiful gowns. Zelda was the first African-American designer to own her own boutique, Shea Zelda, in Harlem. And she had to often sew Joyce into her dresses just before performing. And Joyce had to be carried onto stage, which is a hoot. Bespoke gowns bringing a new sultry shape to femininity, the fit and flare mermaid shape. It's popular even today in wedding gowns, evening gowns. I even had a mermaid shape gown in my prom days. <laughs> Joyce here in her early 20s had a natural elegance, loveliness that made her a vintage style icon our first dark-skinned style icon. And Joyce was a smash hit at the Macombo, where she had a two-week engagement where critics called her the Beltonist babe of the bistro set. This was years before the Ella Fitzgerald Marilyn Monroe incident. Joyce was darker than Ella, one might note, and she had a fantastic smash hit engagement there. In her time, cosmetics were barely available for lighter performers. Lena Horne, for example, had to have Mix Factor formulate cosmetics just for her skin tone. For Joyce, there was nothing but lipstick. This is her natural flawless skin. She was flawless, striking, silky, and just a force to be reckoned with. Au naturel. I think that's what's so fascinating about her. And when Joyce entered a room, she has this beautiful stature, like that of, I would say, like a Greek goddess that you would see in the museums. And I love this pink gown. If I had my way, I would wear one like this all day, every day, <laughs> if I had my way. Mr. Johnson featured Joyce on Ebony's list of the five most beautiful women in the entire world in 1953. Such huge accolades, such a wonderful honor. She was the first dark woman to do so. And the much sought after Coke bottle silhouette began its ascent during this time, naturally. Absolutely beautiful. The hourglass. And Joyce was naturally 
Phillips felt get curvy, the original bronze bombshell, or Black Venus. Absolutely stunning. And her sparkling, girlish feminine smile lit up every room she entered. I think that's why she was so loved. She just had this girlish sweetness about her. Although she also had a bit of va 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 boom. The bronze blonde bombshell. Joyce was the first dark skinned entertainer given the moniker of bombshell, like a Mae West, for example. And also, Joyce faced adversity in Miami, but triumphantly played the Miami Beach Club and Casino Royale, although she did face threats from certain groups. She was triumphant. Joyce is in the pantheon of black glamour icons. And it is well deserved that she is placed there for her natural beauty. These are the photos taken by the famed Harlem Renaissance photographer, Carl Van Vechten, which are now in the Museum of Modern Art, the MoMA in New York City. And of course, Joyce is posed in beautiful 14 karat gold woven Zelda masterpieces. And in a move that surprised many, Joyce became the original drops the mic woman. She took a bow in 1955, having had enough of being pressured into the narcotics world and also not being well looked after by her management. She did not like the underbelly of performing. So she took leave permanently of the scene in 1955 and went on to become a minister for her church, the Seventh-day Adventist. And then she went on to have a successful career as an opera singer for 10 years abroad in Europe. Joyce led her life by the courage of her convictions. When it no longer felt right for her, she returned to her religion and continued in music, but on her own terms. When she returned to the States, she became triumphant again as a well sought after vocal coach for the likes of Jennifer Holliday, Phyllis Hyman, and others. She lived life on her own terms. She had more success after her initial success in the 40s and 50s. And the photo on the right is hanging in the Smithsonian's African American History Museum, where her legacy lives on. Victorious Bryant the Belter. I'm still alive. I'm not dead. I'm 93 years old, so don't count me out. Joyce Bryant said this in 2019. Please visit her on her Instagram. I saw Joyce Bryant was at the Apollo Theater and it was the first and last time I saw her perform and even though Gregory uh, and I at that time we were called the Heinz kids and we worked the Apollo a lot my parents always wanted us to see the great stars there and she was just she was hot as fire you get in the business and all of a sudden you become hot and she was that at that point uh, and I remember sitting in the audience and I remember the beginning uh, it was like Kunga shit Kunga like that and the curtain opened of course, she was the star of the show, and she was behind a scrim, and it was sort of like a blue light on her, and she was in this crouched position, and the band was behind her. I think George Rhodes, who later became uh, Sammy Davis Jr.'s conductor, was conducted for her, I think. 
And as she began to sing, the scrim uh, rose, and she appeared. She had this silver dress on, and her skin, she didn't look like a real person to me, I remember. She looked like surreal. This, 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 this fabulous looking creature that was, was singing so fast, and she sang Running Wild. When I, when, I, when I see her again in Los Angeles, I'm going to ask her if that was the song, because I remember running wild for some reason, and the band was cooking, and she was singing, and, and this voice was so fabulous, and I was just overwhelmed, overwhelmed. I think she also did Love for Sale, wonderful songs, but the performance, I don't remember the songs as much as I remember the performance and the effect that it had on me. I, I forget, I was very young, I forget how old I was. But we were seeing everybody, and that we, and even though we were working there, we'd, we'd see Donna Washington, we'd see Sammy Davis, and we'd see. But she really s stayed in my mind, and I told everybody about her, all my fellow performers. I would always talk about Joyce Bryant and what that was, because she was very different. She was sort of, because Alina, of course, was spectacular, beautiful, but sort of removed, which she later admitted in her in her book, Eartha Challenging. Joyce was inviting. There was something inviting about her. You know, you you wanted to you you sort of you wanted to get to know her, and yet you realized that she was this great artist, and that you you couldn't possibly. It was sort of like that. But she was more inviting, and each of them were originals. All of these ladies were originals, and that's what set them apart. And that's why they they last long. They last forever because they're they're not clones the way they do today. But she was remarkable to me because I remember the sound of her voice. It was so inviting and so remarkable. You know, she had this high voice, this range that was fabulous. It's fabulous, you know. So that was really the first time and it made an impact on me as a performer, because she was a performer too, as opposed to just standing there singing. I mean, she walked the stage, she worked the stage. She just, she, she reached out. She said, she, did, she used to do these movements, she'd reach out like that. Just, you know, and then you want to reach back. <laughs> like, Jay, you're fabulous. I'm Running wild, lost control, running wild, mighty bold, feeling gay, reckless too, carefree mind all the time, never blue, always going, don't know where, always showing, I don't care, don't love nobody, it's not worthwhile, all alone, running wild. No guy is gonna make a fool of me No guy, I mean just what I say I'm not the simple ton I used to be I wonder how I got that way I'm running wild and I've lost control I'm running wild, feeling mighty bold I'm feeling just like a happy child Run, 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 running wild I'm always running and I just don't care I'm always going and I don't know how Don't love nobody cause it's not worthwhile Always going, don't know where, always showing, I don't care, don't love nobody, it's not worthwhile, gone, gone. Try to stare and I cut off all 
all his hair. Yes, love, love is my affair. One look at me, it's plain to see why men like the things I do and say. I use all my charms when I'm in their arms, but when I'm through, we call it a day. Love was made for me. Love was made for me. Get love lessons from me free. Yes, love, love was made for me. Now, girls, don't take my word. Just ask your man. There's some gals that can't, but here's one gal that can. I said love, love was made for me. Love, I put love in the dictionary.
wasn't told me when I wasn't pigtailed. My mama done told me. A man's gonna sweet talk, give you the glad eye. But when the sweet talk is done, a man is a two faced, a worrisome thing who leave you to sing the blues in the night.
pardon day I've been through the mill of love I know every thrill of love Oh, love, oh, love Every love, a true love Love such there be anymore in America. Hardly. Circa 1984 or 83. Uh, Joyce, you're just wonderful. I admire you tremendously. And now I just want you to sing whatever you choose. Uh, Several things about her before she begins. She's a great musician. She's a great singer. And her selection of material 
is no little a part of her great skill. Notice what Sinatra sings. Notice what Nat King Cole sang. Notice what Ella Fitzgerald sings. Part of the wonder of those people, the magic of them, is what they select to sing. Listen. Watch. Thank you. Her pianist is Don Sturrock. Yes. Don Sturrock is the gifted pianist. Magnificent. Here he is. Thank you. Here she is. Thank you. as often as I could have and maybe I didn't treat you quite as good as I should have and if I made you feel second best And I'm sorry I was blind But you were always on my mind You were always on my mind took the time but you were always on my mind you were always on my mind oh tell me tell me that your sweet hasn't died give me give me one more chance to keep you satisfied oh I'm gonna keep you satisfied took the time but you were always on my mind you were always on my mind you were always on my mind Running wild, mighty bold, 
feeling gay, reckless to a heavy mind all the time, never blue, always going, don't know where, I'm always showing, I, I don't care, don't love nobody, it's not worthwhile all alone, I'm running on. No guy is gonna make a fool of me. No guy, I mean just what I say. I'm not the simple time I used to be. I wonder how I got that way. I'm running wild and I've lost control. I'm running wild, feeling mighty bold. I'm feeling just like a happy child. Run, 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 running wild. I'm always running, but I just don't care. I'm always going and I don't know where. Don't love nobody cause it's not worthwhile oh, Run, 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 run and always going I, I don't know where I'm always showing I don't care Don't love nobody It's not worthwhile Because I'm gone I'm gone Hey, David, I'm gone I'm wrong Catch me if you can. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You ask me. If I loved you And I'd choke on my reply I'd rather hurt you honestly Than mislead you with a lie And who am I to judge you On what you say or do I'm only just beginning to see the real you and so Till I 
take this lonely girl. Ah, oh, come on, Phil. <laughs> Like I do, and do the things they say I oughtn't to. But who's to say when it concerns us two? It's only human. Yes, yes. It's only human, I know. If I act fussy or even grouchy too. It's just the fear I have of losing you. The love in me brings on the things I do. It's not inhuman. No, no. It's only human, yeah.